Shearing is still, to this day, a very mystery type trade to a lot of people, and it sort of has that romantic idea around it. The outback and, you know, the tough guys, and as soon as they know you're a shearer, you're a different identity, you're a different person, a different, you just attain a different status. I think the thing that you see now is that you've got some very skilled technicians, and that's really what shearers are. They're, they're top people in their trade, they're skilled athletes, and they know what they want to do, and they want to go out there, they want to earn money, and they want to make the best job they can, and anybody that tells them they shouldn't do that, they're not going to listen. These shearers, these bush workers, have had enough. They've had a gutful of the infighting, watching their conditions disappear, slide, watching the organisation they paid good money to to look after them, being too scared to go out to a shed because it was off the bitumen. What is surprising on actually entering a shed is the amount of noise and sweat attached to the operation. The thump of the machinery is all enveloping, and for the most part the shearers work drenched in their own sweat. The inclination to stop work for a grievance, either real or imagined, must have been almost irresistible. And that's been the key to some of the fiercest industrial battles in this nation's history. Scavaven! Mongrel! Dirty things! Get that scab out! The last great battle, perhaps the last of all, the wide comb strike of 1983. The full bench of the Arbitration Commission met in Sydney this morning against a background of recent violence over the wide comb dispute. All sides agree wide combs mark the beginning of the end for sheer solidarity and it paved the way for December's landmark wage accord between the National Farmers Federation and the Australian Workers' Union. It was hailed as the first industrial peace treaty between graziers and shearers in a century. Now they even talk the same language. For the first time, I think, in a hundred years, we actually got around the table and said, look, this is just crazy. The old system where we stood in a, in a ring and belted each other over the head, and uh, we had our fans on either side cheering us are finished, quite frankly. It's on boards like these in thousands of sheds across Australia that the great shearers' battles have been fought. So despite the recent accord between farmers and union leaders, it's here that industrial revolution has to be accepted by the nation's eight and a half thousand shearers. They've never been keen on change though. You only have to look around places like this to see that nothing much has changed in a hundred years. And there are some dyed-in-the-wool unionists who want to keep it that way. And the only way we're going to take it on is to get the numbers up. Because, I'm, look, I'm damned if I'm going to sit back and watch this come in and call ourselves a union. Steve Roach is on a mission, preaching old-fashioned unionism to some of the staunchest unionists in the country. He's driven by a passion to convert them from the Australian Workers' Union to his new Shearers' and Rural Workers' Union. It wasn't a case of, uh, of the of us just saying, beauty, let's go and start a union. These people have had enough. The simple fact is that if we hung out with the AWU fine, we were going to be dead. You know, the shearing industry would be no more within a couple of years, and that's a fact of life. It was here in Ballarat in 1886 that 40 shearers met to form their first union. By 1894, it had become the AWU, which led to the birth of the Labor Party. 100 years later, Roach formed the Breakaway Union with his own band of 40 rebel shearers. Well, we'd like the luxury of the flash office and the cars and that, but we don't. Uh, it's Melinda. How are we, Johnny? We got me. Roach is not a shearer, but he is an experienced rabble rouser, having been booted out of numerous jobs for industrial activity. Every little bit counts? Oh, absolutely. I suppose because we've had a tight run over Christmas. He finally became a professional unionist with the AWU, but was sacked in 1994 as a result of the merger with the Federated Industrial Manufacturing and Engineering Employees Union, FIMI. Roach now claims the new super union has neglected its roots. 
I would probably count on one hand the amount of officials that I that I think really give it really give a damn about the uh, about the Sheeran guy. You seem to be angrier about well, the union bed, than anybody else. Well, because they're in bed with the bosses, and they have been for some time. So you see the union, the AWU, as as big an enemy as the bosses. Well, I don't see them doing any real good for the blokes in the industry. I mean, it's well and good, you know, kowtowing to what the bosses want all the time and then running around calling yourself a moderate trade unionist. You know, it's well and good to do that. Is that doing the job by the people who pay you to look after their wages and conditions? Yeah, most of the blokes here are the new unions, the rural workers union members, and um, there's only, there might be one or two that the original members, AWU members. Why do they need a new union? Well, I don't think they've had uh, proper representation from the old union, perhaps. At a time of declining unionism, Roach's grassroots appeal is growing. In nine months, he signed up 500 shearers and his attraction is spreading to other industries. About time, Roachie, about time, babe. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. It's good. At Campbell's Mushrooms, the pickers say they want out of the AWU and they're fighting to get Roach in as their union rep. You have the opportunity right here and now. And it doesn't matter how many join, because if we have to hold a meeting out here every week, every week we'll do it. Yes. Yeah. So, how many people, give us a show of hands, how many people are going to join us? How many people are joining us? Okay, well that's good. Okay, we've got 62 new members. I don't like the idea of having to waste my time having to smack the ears of a few boneheads at, at uh, Campbell Mushrooms. But if they are going to persist in treating innocent people the way they are treating them, in denying them their democratic rights to join the organisation that they choose instead of the lackey, lapdog, suck old organisation called the AWU Fine, then we will move in and shut them down. It does sound a bit David and Goliath. Campbell's is a big international company. Can you do that? We will shut them down. How can you? We'll shut them down. Just what muscle Roach has is a moot point, but his big talk seems to be having effect. Word spread to the local stall gold mine where the workers invited him in to represent them. See, where the AWU let us down, when this side agreement come in, we asked and asked for them to come up here and have a meeting with us, and we had a hell zone job to get them here. Yeah. They wouldn't come, they kept putting it off, and it got that way, the hierarchy started to put a bit of pressure on them. Yeah. That's uh, one of the reasons we went into the mine, that's one of the reasons we went to the mushroom farm. There are good unionists there that deserve representation, and they cannot get it from the loafers and from the pretenders that take their money. What he does is he breaks down the very essence of unionism, of unity, right? He's, be, he's, he's actually running at 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction to the fundamental principle on which unions are established. This union has a long tradition with the shares. AWU yeah, officials like Ian Cambridge see Roach as a threat to union solidarity. That's why it fought to prevent him registering as a union. Although the AWU yeah, hired yeah. barristers, Roach, fighting the case himself, won. What will happen in due course, in my estimation, is that when he can't deliver, when he can't deliver improvements in wage rates and conditions because he doesn't have the capacity to do it, those people will see that they've been taken, they've been hoodwinked. It's effectively fraud to, to, to actually ask them for the money to do something which he doesn't have the capacity to do. Is there anything about Steve Roach you admire? Do you know him? Have you met him? Have you listened to I've what met him on a couple of occasions and I think he's quite good on the stump. He says things which often people like to hear. He knows how to say things which are sort of populist in their approach, as did people like Joe Bajoki Peterson. At the end of the day, the conditions that we hold as custodian on behalf of all the future generations of people to come are going to be pissed away by a handful of politically ambitious assholes that he couldn't even tell you the truth. No, it's just a bloody job now, Roach. Yeah, I know. It's just a job. I know. If you ever wanted to deunionise this country, just make everybody join the AWU fine for a couple of years and you'll have the greatest country of non-unionists and anti-unionists that you'd ever seen. Solidarity isn't there today, but the union is still here and the union will stay. 
what the union's got to do is work out how it can still do the best possible job for those people. And sort of setting one shearer against another shearer isn't doing the best thing for them. He says the problem with your union is that you never see you guys out in the bush. I'm not, I'm not saying that we've been perfect. What I'm saying though is that the approach is to improve that, not try to destroy it by, by breaking down the unity. This is just one of the many innovations that are now coming into the industry, a back brace. And the back brace has enabled the shearer to increase his productive life. Of course, the big winner in all the union infighting is the boss. The National Farmers Federation, some would argue, split the union with wide combs. NFF industrial officer John Crawford. There's plenty of sheds now where uh, the unions are completely out of it and uh, the shearers don't want to have a bar of the, the Australian Workers Union. And that's, that's an indication that the shearers themselves and the people in the shed themselves have moved forward and the union hasn't kept up. The union has to keep up with new thinking and new innovation and that's why it's very pleasing that we've been able to sit down with the Australian Workers Union, come to a, a, a perfectly amicable arrangement whereby there is a clear enterprise agreement. How big a threat is Steve Roach's new union? They won't become a threat to the accord uh, simply because the bulk of the people, the vast bulk of the people, are perfectly happy with what's happening. And if there's anybody dis unhappy, it's quite more likely to be on the grazier side than it is on the union side, simply because some of our, our own members are a bit like Steve Roach's members. They want to stay back in the good old dark ages where you fought each other tooth and nail, wasted a lot of energy, and at the end of the day the result was unsatisfactory to both sides. The cocky, uh, miss, uh, the owner of the property, wants to talk to you. Morning. <coughs> I'm Mr Dawson, the owner of Timberoo. If you look uh, at the worst of the Australian uh, shearing industry and employer in part of the grazier, the old grazier type, you saw that in Sunday Too Far Away, yeah. the film. And you saw this you know, uh, grazier, wandering up and down the board. We've still got a few of those. They think that the world owes them a living and everybody else is beneath them. We had a great big party the night before they all went back to boarding school. They were kids, they just had a wonderful time. Really good like that. You know, I don't think the relations have ever been better than they are at the moment. Uh, we understand their problems, they're understanding ours, and we both know that if we don't have a healthy industry, we have no industry. We're providing an end product to a manufacturer of garments. And the shearers and the farmers and everybody else in between is just another link in the chain. Shock treatment had to be administered for the graziers to change. It came in the form of deregulation and the collapse of the wool floor price system, which devastated many of them. But now prices have doubled from their low of 370 cents a kilo, and despite the drought, things are looking up again. How's it going down there? Very good, thank the you. Shop going well? Yes. So you plenty of wool? Uh, as much as I possibly can. Good for you. Oh, we're a sausage. You're on, old mate. You're no bait layer, but anyway, you'll do the job. Good on you, old boy. That's a Garibaldi, too. <laughs> Some shearers, however, claim they're still going backwards. Oh, well, they haven't quite worked out whether we're better than bloody animals or not. The cocky, and not out of expense, just to prove who the boss is, says to the team, if, you, if I hear one complaint about that shower, don't bother putting a tender in for the job next year. I must stick up for the cockies a bit though, John. There are some good ones out there. Oh, they have yeah. septic toilets in outback Australia. They've got septic toilets. It is possible, you can go down to, like I said, Malcolm Fraser's in mid-80s and find drop pits. Uh, the next one here is the showers. No, no doors on them, but they're still Good showers, mostly all men. You have to wonder what the unions have really done for the shearers in the last hundred years. You only have to look at their accommodation. So the standard here is better or about average? Yeah, very, very good. Yeah, it's above average. Yeah. And is this what it's been like for the 40 years you've yeah, been in the industry? Yeah, the industry I've been coming here, it's been like this, well looked after. This is what it was like in yeah. the early days. But Lionel Matthews has seen a lot of crook sheds in the last 40 years. A lot of places, they've just been run down, let go. They say, oh, well, the shearers only there a couple of weeks or two or three weeks a year and it's not worth spending the money on them, but, I mean, it's their home while they're there. And... There's no such thing as knocking off 
when it's really hot, like once it gets to 100 degrees, 120 degrees, it doesn't matter to a shearer because you're supposed to be made of cast iron. A shearer doesn't get sick, you must understand this. According to the powers that be, the only way a shearer ever gets crook is because it's self-induced, which in some circumstances I can well understand when you actually look at the bloody primitive conditions the poor bastards have to work in. Billy Brown's father and four brothers were once all shearers. Now he's lucky to work about four months of the year and, like most proud shearers, refuses the dole the rest of the time. If it's such a tough, unpleasant job, why do people still do it? I mean, most of your family's out of it now. Well, before I started shearing, I had quite a few different jobs. I was a salesman in Myers, I was a lab assistant, and I've been a hairdresser. And all those jobs, you were sort of sucking and catering, and you were never your own person. And with the shearing, it is a hard job. It is one of the few jobs you can actually pitch yourself against another man and come Friday night, like a lot of other different trades that I've been involved in, on Friday night comes around, I put my hand out to get paid. I feel no guilt whatsoever about taking the money because I have actually earned that money. What do we want? Yeah, now. Now. When do we want it? Now! Traditionally, the New Zealand shearers have been blamed for breaking the award, but despite the cries of the Australians that they would take over the industry, a recent Senate inquiry found only 7% of shearers were Kiwis. Indeed, these days, it's Australians who are as likely to be undercutting rates. You can understand the reason why they call them the scabs, because they're the lowest filth that there is. And you still feel so strongly about oh, that? Oh, I detest them. And so does anyone who is a man with any principle whatsoever. It's still the dirtiest four-letter word in a shearer's language, and it sparked some of the bloodiest fights in the union's violent past. Let him go. If he wants to do it, let him do it. You defend a scab, you get what you get. Did I say I did? I get dead. You said it's entitled to his right. You want it? Get out of the way. Did I say a word? You said everything. Come on, Bob. Get me out. The next great battleground for the die-hard unionists is the issue of weekend shearing. This is the last industry where they still jail you for trying to work on the sacred Saturdays and Sundays. Last May, Australian workers' union officials raided Pendine Station near Barcaldon and found Hammonds and his crew breaking the law by working on a Sunday. Weekend shearing is going around, is, all, is happening all across Australia, irrespective of whether our side of the fence want it, irrespective of whether the AWU want it. It's just a fait accompli. Surprisingly, the AWU seems to agree. Well, we have already, across the country, weekend shearing going on, the award being breached or whatever. If we try and fight weekend shearing in the same way that we tried to fight wide combs, then I think we'll wind up with the same outcome. Introduction of some change, but us not getting any dr dramatic benefit for it. So what's your union going to do if the AWU decides to negotiate on weekend shearing? Well, we'd have to fight it. I mean, uh, I would, You'd I would fight strongly, the AWU. I would strongly advise to fight it because it goes on everywhere and, uh, you know, where you get to hear about it, you try to make an effort to, uh, to go and uh, confront the people who, uh, who are putting the practice in the place. I just find it a bit hypocritical that they do that. When on the other hand, if you go and smack a scab in the mouth, they squeal like a stuck pig about the uh, righteousness of law and order. Do you smack too many scabs in the mouth? <laughs> I'm just saying that that's what happens. Roach's followers might also be called the last of the Luddites if the long-promised new technology finally breaks into an industry that last saw innovation in the mechanical handpiece at the turn of the century. Biological wool harvesting involves bringing sheep into a sheep handler where we turn the animal over, we inject the animal with epidermal growth factor, we put a net onto it and then we secure the net along the back line of the sheep. About four to six weeks later we bring the sheep back in again, take the net off and separate the net and the fleece from the animal and let the animal back into the paddock. The CSIRO's Peter St Vincent Welch claims biological shearing is on the verge of getting commercial backing. I believe it will be in widespread use, but it will be many, many years from now. It'll be a change, a gradual change. So eventually this could replace shearing? I, I suspect that it will eventually take over from shearing. Shearing is perhaps the most arduous job 
around in Australia and I think there's going to be problems in the future getting shearers. I think this is a, perhaps a way of, of easing the way of, of the work. Despite shearer and grazier scepticism, the self-shearing sheep is more advanced than novel schemes like this shearing table. And while robotic shearing has been placed on the back burner, many believe it could still have the edge. Do you think it's likely uh, in the next 10, 20 years we might see robots shearing in there? I think you'll find that, I'm certain of that in my own view. Uh, you can't keep doing this because the rest of the world's moving forward and you've got to move forward with them. Well, I think he's been watching too many Robocop films. I mean, the simple fact is that it's not going to happen. They said this sort of thing 20 years ago. They've been looking for ways to get rid of the shearer as long as we've had wool. But it's a more precarious trade now than it's ever been. The click go the shears image we've been used to might not be the one we see in the future. I hope not. Well, it takes away the basic principle of the, uh, the Australian, doesn't it? because the Australian shearer is part of history, is part of folklore. He's always been there. Janine Perrett reporting from the bush.